Hello and welcome to another episode of TCR Express. I'm your digital media editor, Warren Fry, and with me I have... Staff writer at the Journal of Commerce, Russell Hickson. And Russell, uh, the election's looming, but we got a couple weeks till that happens, so what else do you have in the way of stories? Well, um, I'm currently writing a story uh, about a professor at BCIT, and he is a professor of geomatics. So he collects data from construction sites and uses it to provide useful information and tracking and all sorts of things. Um, mm-hmm. And so I chatted with him about what geomatics is, uh, you know, where the field's going and how it's being implemented at the BCIT campus. And uh, he's using drones to uh, catalog uh, and collect data on their health sciences building that's being constructed. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he flies his drone and collects all sorts of uh, interesting data. And he talked about how geomatics is a very old uh, field of study, but it's very tied to technology. So with all this new technology coming out, like uh, like drones and uh, you know things that you can use to begin building digital twins, uh, mm-hmm. and satellites that can provide kind of infrared and stuff that's not even visible to the naked eye. You're getting this massive amount of new data on construction projects. It's really exciting. And it can provide, uh, you know, a, a way to have like a more safe site. So the fewer people you have on site, you know, a busy construction site, that's fewer people that can get hurt. Um, so if you need to look at something or track something using a drone or using satellites or something is a lot safer than having someone walk around a site. And also, uh, it can save you money. Um, he said that they can calculate volume. And, uh, so let's say you need to move a bunch of earth. Um, they can be very precise with the exact amount of work that you need to do and where it's going. So you save time and money and don't waste, um, effort. Cool. Yeah. That's a whole lot of data in one place. Um, yeah. Hopefully people know what to do with it. What's, that's the perennial problem, isn't it? Where uh, you get all this data and then people are, well, well, now what do I do with this? So that's not, not his problem, obviously, but it's but it's always interesting to see how it gets interpreted. Yeah, I mean, I, ta- I, I did bring that up with him where it's just having data isn't necessarily useful in itself. Anybody can mm-hmm. go collect and have a, a massive amount of data, but get, getting meaning out of that data and that's 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 meaningful and actionable is is the challenge. And so he's also found ways to take that data, crunch through it and, you know, provide value to, uh, you know, people who are managing construction sites on how to save money, keep people safer and spot problems. So, yeah, pretty interesting. Cool. And we also have an ongoing series uh, that you're a big part of. So maybe you could uh, give a little more detail on that. Yeah, we to the September 7th. So today, the day that we're recording, we've launched our Cracks in the Foundation series, which is exploring substance use in the construction sector. And uh, we really started working on this um, when we just kept finding study after study, report after report that showed uh, the construction sector is far overrepresented than other sectors um, in overdose deaths. Mm hmm. Uh, in BC, in all over the country. And so we wanted to look into this. So we've been talking with um, substance use experts. Um, You know, we've been talking with treatment centers. We've been talking with construction groups, reading through these reports, all sorts of stuff. And we're rolling out um, a whole series of stories that explore various sides of this issue. And it just uh, started today. And we have a story by Angela Guzmandi, uh, uh, in, in, in Ontario about uh, how drug and alcohol use has skyrocketed during the pandemic. Uh, you know, people are more stressed out, more issues, and how it's kind of fueling that. And we're just going to have a lot more stories on this going forward. Okay, great. And in news from the East, this week, Daily Commercial News staff writer Angela Gizmondi will be speaking to the winners from the 8th Annual CODA Awards, an international art and design competition, recognizing outstanding projects that integrate commissioned art into interior, architectural, or public spaces. Uh, the winners are announced September 1st, including three Canadian public art installations in Toronto, Vancouver, and Edmonton. The winner in the institutional category was Agent Crystalline in Edmonton, submitted by Mark Forens and The Very Many. And in the transportation category, the winner was Sea Change in North Vancouver, BC, submitted by Jill Anhold Studio. In June, the top 100 entries selected by the CODA Awards jury were announced online for the public to vote on their favorite artworks.
Why You Seafood at Yorkdale Mall in Serrano, submitted by Dialogue 38, received one of the Two People's Choice Awards. And Daily Commercial News staff writer Don Wall just wrote about how professors at Queen's University Faculty of Engineering in Kingston, Ontario, have issued an invitation to the Afghan girls robotics team, encouraging them to settle in the city. The message was addressed to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on August 20th through a petition posted at change.org. The girls, now thought to be aged between 14 and 18, visited Ontario in 2018 and competed in a robotics competition and met Trudeau in Ottawa. Heidi Ploeg, Queen's Chair for Women in Engineering, posted the petition. Some of the girls have reportedly expressed an interest in coming to Canada. Quote, at the moment, we just have to wait and see whether there are some women in their families who would like to settle in Canada or Kingston, said the professor. From the petition, there would be a lot of support for them to make it happen. On September 28th and 29th, with the annual Canada virtual conference, and uh, this year we're doing a quick hits on TCR Express, so you can get a, a flavor of some of the speakers talking at the conference itself. This week's quick hit is with Mark Milk. He's the equity research analyst in metals and mining at Bank of America, and you can listen to my short interview with him right here. Hi there, it's Mark Milkey, and I'll be speaking at the upcoming Can Data to Conference on why Canada's energy sector matters to tax revenues, jobs, the economy, and your company. And so why does uh, the energy sector matter? Well, it provides uh, a ton of jobs in Canada, uh, but let's quantify a ton. Um, you, you're talking about several hundred thousand jobs directly and indirectly in the energy sector in Canada, and the bulk majority of those are oil and gas jobs. And uh, oil and gas matters to specific um, cohorts of Canadians. If you're Indigenous, for example, in the oil sands, um, and one of the First Nations involved in the oil sands in northern Alberta, your income is significantly higher than those in the average sector across the country. Uh, the difference is about $100,000. You'll earn about $144,000 on average in the oil sands if you're an Indigenous person working in that sector. But if you're in other, the average uh, industrial wage across the country for an Indigenous person is $47,000. So there are all sorts of elements of oil and gas in Canada that matter to a lot of communities, um, as well as to specific individuals. And it uh, matters to governments as well in terms of tax revenues. Um, and I can detail a bit of that in the, uh, in the presentation and will. So it, uh, it, it helps to understand that the oil and gas sector in Canada really is one of the largest sectors in the country, the largest sector in the country uh, as a proportion of GDP. Okay, and Canada is primarily an economic forecasting conference. So how does oil and gas tie into that? Obviously, like you said, it's a, it's, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest driver of, of, of economics in our country, but with people trying to be sustainable and 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 some pushback on oil and gas, how, do, how does the forecast look, is I guess what I'm asking. Sure. Well. What we know already is if, if the concern is greenhouse gas emissions, and it is obviously um, in select circles, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have been, uh, the, the intensity of those greenhouse gas emissions has been coming down. Um, so for example, what that means is you're getting uh, more oil and gas out of the ground, but uh, each barrel is producing less in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a positive development. Uh, the reason greenhouse gas emissions are going up in Canada is because we are producing ever more energy um, as an export country, and that's going to continue for some time. But the emissions intensity, um, you know, the the, uh, the emissions per barrel are going down, which is a positive development. But uh, the future as well, it's it's impossible to think about Canada and oil and gas without thinking about rest of the the rest of the world and where it's going. Let me give you some examples. If you look at Africa and you look at Asia. In the past 30 years, the population of Africa has doubled, and it's going to double again to 2050. If you look at Asia, the population there in the last 30 years has risen by over 40% to 4.6 billion people. Asia is still on a growth path population-wise for the next 30 years. It's going to grow by another 20% to over 5.5 billion people. And what that means is the people in Asia and Africa, if you look at just those two regions alone, are going to need... Uh, more energy. And right now, there is no substitute for oil and gas. Um, one of the experts on this, on, on what's known as energy transition, um, is Vaslav Smil, uh, Professor Emer Emeritus of the Environment at uh, the University of Manitoba, um, and a favorite of Bill Gates, uh, who you know most people are more familiar with the latter than the former. But Professor Smil has pointed out time and again that um, there is no substitute right now for uh, fossil fuels because they pack a power punch. Uh, but other fuels do not, including renewables. So Asia and Africa, those two regions alone, are going to drive demand for oil and gas. And so one has to pay attention to that in Canada. Um, 
And as these regions grow um, in population, their economies will grow most likely. I mean, Nigeria's GDP, for example, right now is uh, about nine times higher than it was 30 years ago. You can expect a place like Nigeria, a country like Nigeria, with its population and economic growth, that it's going to need a lot more energy. And, um, you know, there, there are energy sources that are cleaner than others. Uh, natural gas is cleaner than coal, and you can't replace gasoline or diesel in uh, transport trucks right now or planes. So um, the future is still going to be dominated by, by oil and gas, um, despite the, the doubts that some people have or the advocacy that some people have. Okay, and if you'd like to hear more of what Mark has to say, he will be speaking at Canada on September 29th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Once again, that's Canada at a virtual conference on September 28th and 29th. Don't forget to register. And if you'd like to hear more of TCR Express or the Friday Construction Record podcast, you can listen to us on Amazon Music, Apple Music, or Spotify. And you can listen to us at the Daily Commercial News and Journal of Commerce websites. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you.